time. So I think that we can start. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Maxim Gorlich, who is, uh, whom I uh, know from the time when I was his opening the candidate dissertation. Uh, this is a pros of the uh, get PhD degree in Russia. So I was his opponent and I read his thesis, like it very much and support him, I hope. And from that time, I traced the works of Maxim and uh, recently he approached us to give him some recommendation and in the process of this recommendation, we asked him to present this talk. So we expect very nice and interesting talk from Maxim and Maxim, you're welcome. If you can certainly introduce yourself before, it would also be good, but... Uh... Yes, Th thank you, Nikolai, for kind introduction, and thanks a lot for inviting me. So it's a big pleasure for me to give a seminar in such place as Skoltir. Uh, well, literally, but still, uh, I hope uh, this will be interesting for all of us. So today I will speak about photonic topological states, approaches to tailor the flow of light. And a couple of words about myself. So I'm working in ITMO University, which is located in St. Petersburg in Russia. Uh, and uh, so a series of our recent works were devoted to this direction. So I will try to overview some of the ideas and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share with you some excitement about this uh, field. So I originally assumed that uh, the audience is like non-expert in, in topology. So I prepared some brief introduction but before that, let me introduce uh, Itmo University. Uh, so as I told you, it's located in St. Petersburg and our traditional areas of academic strength are related, uh, first of all, to computer science and also to optics and photonics. But currently new directions are also actively developing uh, in particular in the frame of priority 2030 program. So we are, uh, as a university, we are looking in life sciences in chemistry and actively developing uh, ourselves in those directions as well. So I work at uh, School of Physics and Engineering, uh, which originated from a small metamaterials laboratory, which was founded by uh, Professor Pavel Belov, who was actually my supervisor during PhD. Uh, and so originally we started the research from metamaterials and meta surfaces, but later we took no new and new topics uh, like all the electric nanophotonics. Uh, biophotonics, nano-optomechanics, uh, some devices for magnetic resonance imaging, employing metasurfaces, uh, some approaches to wireless power transfer, and so on and so forth. Obviously, I do not have enough time to cover all the topics, and actually I'm not an expert in all these topics, uh, and uh, so I will focus my talk on a specific direction, namely topological photonics. Uh, so, for those people who are not aware uh, about this field, let me uh, briefly introduce you to this concept and explain how this is related to physics. So, in mathematics, topology studies some quantities which remain unchanged under the continuous deformations. And an example of such relation uh, is presented by relatively old and well-celebrated gauss barnett theorem, which basically tells us the following. So imagine a closed surface, uh, you measure the curvature of this surface in every point, and then integrate the result divided by two pi. And then this theorem states that the result which you get is necessarily an integer, and it is related to the number of the holes uh, in this surface. So in the other words, uh, on the left-hand side, you have some local quantity, but after you, you do the integration, you get some invariant, which does not change if you are doing some continuous deformations. Let's say uh, deforming the sphere to, the, to this spoon or def deforming a thorus to the cup and so on. And you can ascribe some invariants uh, which cor uh, correspond to this Euler characteristic to all these figures. Maxim, uh, yes. just, can we ask questions during your talk? Or you yes, please, please, you're welcome. And then I have a short question. I saw this formula a lot of times and never understood why it is not 4 pi in the denominator, and I, then it will be 1 minus g. Do you know why it is 2 pi? Uh, yes, I hope uh, there, I will be able to explain. Of course, this is a form of representation, but mm -hmm. then we, when we will be discussing the band structures, chair numbers, maybe mm -hmm. we will see some analogy. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that's the only explanation which I have, because mm -hmm. why not to divide by two left and right hand side? Mm -hmm. No problem here. 
So, and then, of course, this picture is nice, but we have to relate somehow this topology to physics. This is our uh, main goal as physicists. And for that purpose, let us consider some quantum system, which is described by the Hamiltonian, which depends on some external parameters. This might be some magnetic field or uh, wave number in the case of periodic crystal and so on. And these parameters uh, are slowly varied in time. Uh, and imagine that this vector of parameters changes uh, along a closed loop in the parameter space. So we start our evolution in the point A, then we are moving along this loop and finish our evolution in very same point. Then if we open the third volume of Landau Lipschitz, let's say, uh, we can find there a diabatic theorem, which tells us basically that if the parameters of the system are varied sufficiently slowly, and our system originally stays in a specific eigenstate of our Hamilton, then uh, uh, with the course of time, uh, the system should stay in the same eigenstate. So quantum transitions uh, to, to all other eigenstate will be suppressed as long as, as the evolution is adiabatic. Therefore, uh, after doing a look in the parameter space, we should recover the original wave function. So uh, mathematic, from the mathematical point of view, our final wave function will be given by the product of the original wave function times some dynamic phase, which is the usual one. So this is the phase acquired by all stationary states in the Schrodinger picture uh, during the time evolution. No surprise here. But on top of that, we can also add some uh, we can also have some additional uh, geometric phase. And this was first discussed uh, in the seminal pa paper by Michael Berry, published back in 1984. Uh, and below in a couple of slides, we will discuss what physical consequences of this additional geometric uh, phase. Now, before proceeding, uh, let us draw a simple geometric analogy of these Berry phases. Uh, with something which, which you might be familiar with from the differential geometry. Imagine that we have some vector field uh, defined on the surface of the sphere. And let's imagine that we are doing a parallel transport of a vector which is defined in the point P, so this red arrow, which I'm showing to you. Uh, and then we are doing parallel transport uh, of this vector, maintaining the angle between the vector and its trajectory. Uh, and so we'll go to the point R. After that, we, we do the same parallel transport of our vector field from point R to point Q, and then back from point Q to point P. And as you can notice, uh, the original direction of the vector does not coincide with the final direction of the vector. There is some non-zero angle between them. And actually in the differential geometry, it is shown, it can be shown that um, this rotation of the vector after a parallel transport along a closed loop is related to the curvature of the surface. Very, in, in, in a, very similarly to that, in the case of uh, Berry phase, uh, we consider a variation of the parameters of the system along the closed path. And instead of the rotation of the vector, we get some additional phase acquired by the wave function. And this provides like geometric uh, analog of Berry phase, so some hand waving picture. Now, if we uh, dive deeper in the math behind the uh, Berry phases, we may deduce the specific expression for the Berry phase, which is given by the line integral of some uh, vector field, which is called Berry connection, times uh, tangential vector along a path in the parameter space. So this quantity, uh, Berry connection, uh, is defined in terms of the eigenfunctions and their derivatives with respect to parameters, good, uh, of course, we can transform this expression uh, via Stokes theorem. So we, we have a product of some of curl of this connection uh, and integrate the result over the surface uh, related to that path, uh, to that closed path. And this quantity, which is highlighted by blue, is called Berry curvature. So why this is important and which kind of interesting results we can get from here? It turns out that if we take an integral of this Berry curvature over a closed surface, then it can acquire only a discrete set of values uh, uh, to pi times uh, some integer number, which is called churn number uh, related to the specific uh, you know, eigenstate or band in the case of uh, periodic solids. So this quantization is already interesting fact 
But the main question is how that how is that related to some observable uh, properties? So in the case of periodic systems, uh, this parameter R uh, is just a block wave vector K, which is which always arises in periodic systems due to the block theorem. And then let's let's discuss what what are observable effects due to the recursion. This is uh, the most interesting. Excuse me. Please. Uh, could you show a previous slide? I'm confused. Uh, n is, is it a unit vector or n is just integer number? No, here here n is the unit vector normal. Okay, at the left gamma n. But here, uh, which is not bold, here this is an integer. So yes, ah. so, sorry for unclear designations. So uh, okay. these these guys which are not bold, this is just number one, two, three, four, and this is unit vector. Yeah, I have to, I have to change the designations to avoid inconsistencies. Good. So now the main question: What are observable effects? So we got some nice uh, quantized Chern numbers, but how they can be measured? Let's say how they are manifested in some experiments. That's the main question. So as you know from solid from the courses of solid state physics, if you want to calculate uh, the velocity, let's say, of electron in some periodic potential, normally you would expect that you have to take the derivative of the energy of the electron with respect to wave number. Mm -hmm. This is kind of standard, the usual group velocity, the omega over decay, roughly speaking. However, it turns out that in some cases, uh, it's, it's not enough. And uh, if you are calculating the things carefully, you have to add an extra term. Let's look at it more closely. So you have a vector product of applied electric field and some vector, which is defined, in fact, by the structure of our bands. So this is the periodic part of the wave function. You take the derivative of this periodic part, you take vector product. And so this vector should be plugged in here. And this additional correction is known in the literature as anomalous velocity. Uh, this was measured uh, directly um, not so long ago in the, uh, for the case of cold atoms in the optical lattice, for instance. But more importantly, this anomalous velocity is also manifested in some collective phenomena. So you imagine the flow of electrons, a lot of electrons uh, going in some direction. And you see that the current formed by these electrons appears to be orthogonal to the applied electric field. And this immediately resembles as the picture of, of the whole effect. When you have uh, some current, uh, which flows through the conductor placed in the external magnetic field, and you have some voltage in the transverse direction. So the ratio of the uh, current density uh, to the strength of the electric field in the transverse direction is, is known as whole conductivity, sigma xy, y xy, because we consider current which flows in x direction and electric field in y direction. And so after playing with these formulas, uh, one may obtain the following expression for this whole conductivity. It is uh, represented as a product of some universal co constant, which is the combination of electrons charge and Planck's constant times sum of churn numbers of all field electronic bands. So this churn number is like a mathematical uh, construction but it appears in a measurable quantity in the whole conductivity. And actually, this result explains why whole conductivity in strong magnetic field and uh, under sufficiently low temperature is quantized. So this is a so-called integer quantum hole effect. And we see that this integer number is related to the sum of churn numbers. And since this churn number is a topological quantity, physically, this means that the quantization of the whole conductance is robust to some imperfections or defects which may appear in the sample. It doesn't matter. Even if we have some defects, the quantization remains precise. And so this topological nature of the quantum hole effect was understood uh, in 1980s. And I, I should mention that uh, the discovery of the integer quantum hole effect was marked by the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1985. So for those who are interested in the details, uh, I refer them to, to this uh, nice review paper in Reviews of Modern Physics, which discusses very phase effects on electronic properties. Uh, and now uh, I would proceed further uh, because there is one more important implication of the topology, uh, which is manifested in the so-called bulk boundary correspondence. 
So to understand this principle, uh, let us consider the interface of the two structures. Uh, they have some bands. And let's imagine for the moment that one of the structures has uh, like topologically non-trivial band here and trivial band on the top, let's say, and another structure has uh, the, uh, a different order or inverted order of the bands as shown in the picture. Then imagine that they share the same band gap. So at the same frequency, both structures do not support any propagating waves. And let us define gap churn number, which is given by, by the sum of churn numbers of all bands below this level. So we needed to see that these two structures have different churn numbers. And then bulk boundary correspondence guarantees us that if these two uh, gap churn numbers are different, there should be necessarily a localized state propagating at the boundary of, between the two structures. And this state should be robust to some defects or imperfections which can be placed on the boundary because its existence is guaranteed by the bulk topology of the systems. And so in this animation... Uh, Maxim, sorry. Uh, I, I'm confused a little bit. What does it mean, this uh, blue curve? Uh, at the left, C2 is equal to zero, and then it goes down, and still C2 is zero. So basically, what does it mean? Yeah, basically this, uh, this curve denotes the edge of, the, uh, of some bands. And since we have two distinct structures, uh, so this electronic band can, can be, let's say, uh, we consider the band with some fixed symmetry of the uh, eigenfunction. Here it's on the top. And here it's on the bottom. So we get band inversion. Uh, on the top of what? Some, some band? So the, the, this axis corresponds to the energy, this one vertical. And okay. this, is, this is like coordinate. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and since we have like smooth transition from one structure to the other, then we have some change of the, of the electronic bands with the coordinate. And that's that's what is schematically depicted in this picture. Of course, the okay, picture is so ideal. It's just energy. Okay. Yes. And so this picture, uh, this animation. So let me try to launch it one more time. So this animation shows the propagation of the H state. So I, I took like a simple topological model, Hobbian model, did type bounded calculation just to, for illustration purposes. Uh, so we have. Uh, some mode which propagates at the edge, and most importantly, it goes in one direction. So time reversal symmetry of this structure is broken, and there is no mode propagating backwards at the same frequency. Good, but then the question, how, how can we assess uh, disorder robustness of this? I, I'm uh, sorry, Max. Sorry. Sorry for interruption, but uh, what does it mean, color bar? What is the units? What are the units? Of uh, the, the magnitude, let's say the magnitude of the field in a given site. Uh, okay, so, amplitude. Uh, the yes, field. yes, the amplitude or the intensity uh, depends. I guess here we, we are plotting the amplitude. Uh, uh, absolute value of the amplitude, right? Right, that. Okay. So uh, the, the yellow color denotes the maximal amplitude and the blue color denotes the minimum amplitude. This means that the all, almost all energy of our eigenmode is concentrated at the edge of the structure. And if we look at the animation, we see that the propagation goes in a specific direction. Uh, so this mode is running, let's say, clockwise. Uh, and then another question, how the, man, uh, how the disorder robust nature of this mode is manifested, uh, at least in the calculations. Uh, for that purpose, I add here some frequency detuning of these sides, so they're frequency detuned, and then our eigenstate, uh, it cannot propagate outside of the structure because there is nothing where it can propagate. Uh, this eigenstate also cannot propagate in the bulk of the structure because we are working at the frequencies that correspond to the bulk band gap. Good, but at least uh, we may expect that it would uh, scatter backwards at this, uh, at this defect. However, this does not happen. Why? Because there is no mode which is going backwards. So the only option left is to go 
around these sharp defects without any backscattering. And this is nice feature of topological modes, which determined the interest of the researchers uh, to investigate this physics, uh, to try to implement it in, in various platforms, uh, acoustics, mechanics, and also optics. So here I would like to highlight that this physics, so we discussed some electronic systems, but importantly, uh, this physics is uh, more or less universal. It is inherent to all uh, wave phenomena. So this can happen in acoustics, mechanics, electromagnetics, polaritonics. Uh, for instance, Dmitry Solonskov is doing a series of nice works on topological uh, polaritonics. So uh, this is very ubiquitous and uh, general phenomenon. And uh, in our group Excuse here- me, May I ask one question about the previous slide? Please. Uh, what kind of lattice is that? Uh, for me, it looks like honeycomb, actually. Gra yes. Graphene-like, right? Uh, yes, it's graphene-like lattice, but the trick is that uh, uh, in Haldane model, on top of these nearest neighbor couplings, we have to introduce the coupling between the next nearest neighbors, which are complex, and, and these uh, phases of the complex couplings uh, are different, uh, uh, depending on the fact whether you are hopping clockwise or counterclockwise. And then this, this determines, uh, this is the symmetry break in perturbation, which breaks uh, time reversal symmetry. Okay, uh, because as, as far as I know, for just nearest neighbor model, uh, edge states exist only along zigzag edges, right? It, they do not exist along armchair edges. So yeah, so your next nearest neighbor yeah. and this additional phases allows you to have edge states along armchairs, armchair edge. Um, yes, right? as, as we see, yes. Okay. So okay. this is this is so-called Haldane model. This is uh, quite quite uh, established one, but uh, it is indeed important that this is different from the conventional tight binding honey complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So and now I switch uh, to these topological states of light, which were uh, heavily explored. And the first experimental work dates back to two thousand nine. So the first experimental demonstration of one-way disorder robust propagation of light. And since that time, the whole field exploded because scientists were keen uh, to demonstrate some flows of light which are robust to disorder. So this is like ideal candidate for some photonic chips or whatever, uh, which is heavily advertised in, photo advertised in photonics community. And so uh, in a few years, people realized these topological states at the infrared and even in the visible frequencies. So they tailored some high order of topological structures, which I will mention uh, a bit later. Uh, they also pioneered some topological metamaterials. And so the pioneer of that direction was uh, Professor Alexander Hanika, with whom we are actively collaborating. Uh, also, they introduced the concept of topological states of quantum light. Uh, and recently, the group by Professor Moti Segifan, a technium in Israel, they introduced the concept of topological laser. So, so they suggested to synchronize several independent emitters by topological mode, uh, promising some very powerful uh, lasers. So this is also actively researched. And so the whole, uh, this field is nicely described in this recent review paper, which I recommend uh, for those who are interested in more details. And so this brings me to, to the original part, finally. So I have to, to tell you some original results, of course. And so uh, in this talk, I would like to focus on new approaches, which we recently suggested to tailor the topology of the bands. So what is the traditional technique uh, to design something topological, let's say? So imagine that we know all those nice properties, which we discussed with you, and now we want to, to construct some uh, topological structure. So the usual recipe is the following. Design some uh, non-standard lattice. So you have to manipulate the couplings between the elements. For, inst for instance, you may consider two alternating uh, distances in the lattice. You may construct some breathing kagome lattices or breathing honeycomb lattices. This is extensively described in the literature. So in all these cases, uh, you have to design uh, the lattice of the structure very, very carefully. This is crucial in obtaining a topological phase. What we propose instead is the following concept. So you may, uh, may use very simple lattice, let's say equidistant lattice. Uh, all sides are at the same distance, but 
uh, you have to tailor the resonances of the individual particle. In that case, you can forget about designing the lattice, but instead tailor the individual con uh, constituents, the individual matter atoms. And in that way, it is possible to obtain uh, topological states, which may be highly tunable. Uh, we demonstrated that in experiments. And this concept can be brought also to the two-dimensional case as uh, described in our recent also experimental work. So I will uh, discuss more details uh, about this proposal, this concept in a couple of slides. Uh, so this direction is actively pursued by my PhD student, Daniel Bobolov. We are also collaborating with experimentalists, uh, both here in ITMO and in China. Uh, so let me first discuss how, do, how we optimize the individual inclusions, the individual meta atoms. For that purpose, let us consider seemingly very simple particle, which has the shape of cylinder. So uh, this cylinder, as, as any particle, has different resonances, uh, different eigenmodes. And we can classify these eigenmodes uh, in terms of their multiple moments. Uh, so each eigenmode has its well-defined frequency, and this frequency depends on the ratio between the height of the cylinder and its diameter. So imagine for the moment that we fix the diameter of the cylinder and change its height. It turns out that modes with the different symmetry of the field are crossing with each other. And for some parameters, we may also overlap uh, in plane electric dipoles, so uh, which align in XY plane, and in plane magnetic dipoles, which align exactly in the same plane. But now if we recall some symmetry considerations, we, we immediately understand that electric dipole moment uh, is even under reflection in xy plane because this is polar vector. On the contrary, magnetic dipole moment appears to be odd under reflection in xy plane because this is axial vector. Uh, so th these, uh, these two multiple moments have distinct symmetry with respect to, to reflection. And uh, if we have this reflection symmetry, all modes should be either even or odd. However, if we break the reflection, reflection symmetry in this plane, for instance, by adding some small cap on this cylinder or drilling a small hole, not through the whole cylinder, but just a small perturbation on the top, we break the reflection symmetry. In this way, we mix these magnetic dipole and electric dipole modes. And so the eigenmodes of this perturbed particle contain both electric and magnetic dipole moments. This means that the incident electric field, for instance, will uh, excite electric dipole. In this way, it will excite the eigenmode, which is mixed. And then magnetic dipole moment will be generated. So a, a good math behind this qualitative picture uh, is presented by these uh, formulas. So this is the concept of bionisotropic response. The incident uh, elect electric dipole moment of the particle is generated both by the incident electric field and incident magnetic field. In, 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 the, in a similar fashion, magnetic dipole moment of the particle is generated not only by the magnetic field, but also by the incident electric field. These tensors, alpha EM and alpha ME, are known as magnetoelectric coupling. And the, and the structure of these tensors is, of course, dictated by the symmetries of the particle. For instance, here we have uh, z-axis uh, of rotational symmetry of the particle, and then uh, only possible structures of these magnetoelectric coupling tensors is given by this formula. So if you look to the textbooks on bionisotropic media, this is the so-called omega-type bionisotropy. Uh, this is, it is called in this way because a mega-shaped particle has exactly this type of bionisotropic response. Good, so it's, it's more or less clear how the single particle works. Uh, let us draw a qualitative picture how several such particles will interact with each other. So as, as we discussed in the previous slide, we can, by choosing the suitable aspect ratio of the disk, we can overlap electric and magnetic resonances for in-plane dipoles for the individual disk. If we perturb the disk, we ensure that electric and magnetic dipole moments mix. So imaginary unity is added here to, uh, for consistency with the fact 
that electric dipole moment and magnetic dipole moment transform differently under time reversal operation. And now the most important thing, uh, at least for the design which we are reporting. Now compare the two configurations. So we put two disks, which are orientated in the same way on a fixed distance between them. And we compare uh, the coupling of these two disks to a different picture when we have different orientation of the disks. So this disk has a hole on the top and this disk has a hole on the bottom. Uh, obviously, the resonances of the individual disk will split due to the interaction of the particles with each other. This is obvious. Uh, and, the, and the splitting of these modes quantifies the strength of, magnetic, of, of the coupling, uh, of electromagnetic coupling between the disks. And it turns out that these splittings are different. So the splitting for the case when the disks are oriented in the same way, and the splitting for the case when the disks are oriented in a different way. So the ratio of these uh, splittings uh, can be estimated from theory. It, is, it's, it appears to be three, uh, but numerical simulations which take into account radiation losses, uh, all this stuff, which is ignored in a simplified theoretical estimate, give only 1.14. So one coupling is only 14% larger than another. But at any case, we get some difference in the coupling rates. And then we may think about designing some structure uh, which is shown in this picture. So the coupling between the first and the second disk is different from the coupling between the second and the third. Then we get the same, the first coupling, then the second, the first, and so on. So in a very rough approximation, we may consider this structure as a set of sites coupled with each other via alternating coupling amplitudes. And this, this system is very, very well known and well celebrated in the literature because this is the simplest example of one dimensional topological model known as su schrader hegel model. But contrary to the realizations which were vastly reported in the literature, so I put just a couple of references, but there are dozens of references devoted to this SSH model. A lot of people uh, worked in that direction, did numerous realizations, exact arrays, whatever. Uh, but importantly, here we are using equidistant lattice, and uh, we are playing uh, with this degree of freedom. We can just flip the disk over and change the dimerization. And this uh, system, Sushri Thurkigur model, is known to host topological edge state at the weak link edge. And uh, a remarkable thing about it is that uh, even if we introduce some disorder in the couplings between these sites, we still recover the same frequency of the H mode. And in this sense, uh, the H state frequency is somehow protected, at least against certain types of the disorder. So uh, for convenience of the audience, I will briefly revisit the physical of the SSH model just to, to give you a flavor of how this works. So if we have this system of the, of the sites, which are coupled to their nearest neighbors via alternating coupling amplitudes, then naturally we get a unit cell with the two particles in it. And hence we get two bands in the tight binding description. And there is a single edge state at zero energy, exactly in the middle of the band gap. And this picture shows the profile of the edge state, let's say the amplitude of the field in each side versus the number of the side. We, we get the exponential decay. So this is localized state. And if we introduce some disorder in the coupling, so we add some random fluctuations to this uh, coupling strength, the spectrum changes, of course, which is expected. But no, look at this zero energy mode. It stays pinned exactly to the same value. And this is important. So its frequency is like topologically protected against different types of disorder. Uh, and even though the profile of this H state changes a little bit, its frequency stays the same. And this characteristic pattern, large amplitude zero, smaller amplitude zero, smaller amplitude zero, and so on. So this staggered profile of the, of the field remains. Good. So now we like got the idea how to realize some similar physics but with the help of the equidistant array. Martin, and they, uh, yes. Martin, sorry, uh, once again, uh, the, the fact is very nice, uh, but do you have some uh, 
some easy explanation why it is so robust, this uh, surface frequency. Why does not it depend, for instance, on, I don't know, size of your particles or whatever disorder? Uh, well, uh, yeah. no, no. By the way, you, you said about disorder, it is disorder in position or in what kind of disorder is here? Yeah, good question. Thank you, Nikolai. So it, it, it is important to highlight that uh, this model is robust to the disorder in the coupling. So the distance between the disks, if we are speaking about physical realization, but it is not robust uh, to, to the disorder in the eigenfrequencies of the disks, for instance. So if I make this disk larger, then the whole picture will deteriorate. Uh, and this uh, type of robustness, so we have limited robustness, of course, because there are no, uh, as, as uh, Americans say, there is no free lunch. So this is exactly the case. Uh, but uh, how this works? Uh, there is a special symmetry called chiral symmetry uh, inherent to this model. And due to the presence of this symmetry, uh, for every eigenstate with positive energy, you can construct the eigenstate with the negative energy. Uh, so these eigenstates appear in pairs. Now, if you, if you say that you have a single H state, uh, obviously it doesn't have any partner. Uh, and then the only conclusion which is left uh, is that this single state, which doesn't have a partner, it has zero energy and it is related to itself via chiral symmetry operation. So this is some intrinsic symmetry uh, of the model which guarantees uh, the robustness. But, okay, still the question is what, what is zero here? So you measure energy from something and uh, there is uh, yes. some additional assumption about the symmetry of your structure, if I understood correctly. Uh, so uh, by saying zero energy, I mean that uh, the oscillate, uh, I set uh, the eigenfrequency of this individual side to zero for simplicity. So more precisely, I should put here omega zero, eigenfrequency of the isolated side. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, frequency. And Okay, yeah, and, this, and, this, and this is more or less uh, constant. Yeah, so not more or less, you, 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 you keep it constant in your disorder, as you said. Yeah, yes, it, it appears to be constant, even if we introduce the disorder in the complex. Oh, yeah, you, you said you, you have the, this tablet, and this tablet, it has two states, if I just correctly, yeah? Mm -hmm. And these states, uh, they are splitted. Is it correct understanding or? Well, uh, here I, I previously, the previous slide, I made this logical trick. So I, here I'm discussing, of course, uh, a disk with two degrees of freedom, but now mm -hmm. I switched like to the, the model of single mode sites. So I'm like explaining uh, first simple qualitative picture, and then I will go back to our original electromagnetic okay. design. Mm -hmm. So here I have only one resonance. And mm -hmm. yes, I, I, I'm saying that each of these uh, sites have the same eigenfrequency omega, omega zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we shouldn't perturb this eigenfrequency because otherwise the symmetries of our model will be broken. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And under, under this assumption, we get disorder robustness. If this assumption do not hold, then of course, unfortunately, uh, we are not pro protected against various types of disorder. Mm -hmm. And so now we, we, we make go step uh, further. So. The physics of the Suchlifer Higer model is, is uh, like well known, so it's not original, but our design with the disks uh, is, is original. So now we, we have to do some calculations to confirm that this system is indeed topological. How do we do that? So we first, we choose the unit cell. We have four disks in the unit cell. Each of the disks has two degrees of freedom, electric and magnetic dipole moment. So overall eight degrees of freedom and hence eight bands. So we get all, all these eight bands, both in analytics and numerics, fine. Then there is an extra symmetry of this structure, uh, which guarantees the pairwise degeneracy of the bands at the edges of the brilliant zone. Because you may took just two disks, these two, and then reproduce the whole structure by making uh, translation plus mirror reflection. So instead of the usual translation. And this, uh, type of symmetry guarantees pairwise degeneracy. We recover it in numerical simulations, of course. But what is more interesting, now we can simulate the finite system uh, consisting of the finite number of sites. And then uh, these domains shaded by gray correspond to the bulk bands, which are retrieved from these numerical simulations. And we see clearly that there are some eigenstates 
which are shown here, uh, which fall in the bulk band gaps. Very interesting. So if we get some state in the band gap, this should be some localized mode. Uh, and then good, we do numerical simulations. We pick up this, we pick this frequency and see the profile of the H mode. Uh, here I'm showing the absolute value of electric field. This is a uh, simulation in terms of multi physics. And indeed we recover the usual staggered uh, pattern of electric field, which is characteristic to the Sushri for Hegel model. But importantly, here we have an equidistant lattice and we play all the game around uh, orientation dependent coupling of the particles. Uh, of course, so we, we, we did that paper actually back in the autumn 2019, and then we submitted it, uh, we were like, I'm lucky enough to submit it to laser and photonics reviews. This is really, really slow journal. So like three months for, for, the, for the one round of the review, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's really slow. And then the referees asked us to do a lot of additional checks, uh, everything they could Imagine we did all those checks. So first of all, we have to confirm that this is indeed topological. For that, you have to do the calculation of topological invariance. Probably I will not go into much details, but we were able to confirm from the first principles, uh, from the full wave numerical simulations, that this structure is indeed topological and there is a non-zero zap phase associated with these bands. Then we checked how this mode behaves uh, with the disorder, because uh, if this is topological, it should be robust. We, we did a lot of disorder, uh, we added a lot of disorder in the positions of the disks, as we discussed with Nikolai previously, uh, which guarantees that we have some fluctuations in the couplings between the disks. In this picture, you can see that the distances are changed a lot, but still we, we recover uh, like almost the same profile. Uh, the mode, this uh, H mode persists, so it is more or less robust. But there is only one problem, uh, but the big one. So uh, the dimerization, so the difference between this coupling and this coupling is not, not too large. So only 14%. And it was completely clear that it's not super practical for, uh, for experiments. Of course, it was pandemic, so we were not able to make experiments. Uh, so we, we stopped uh, at that point uh, with this design. But uh, and published this work in laser and photonics reviews, so it took a lot of time. But we were thinking about some experiments because if you're a physicist, if you're doing some interesting prediction, this should be somehow verified experimentally. Another concern which we had is the following Can we tune these topological properties, so the localization of this H mole, continuously? Because here we have a degree of freedom, we can just flip over the disk, and that's it. This is like discrete uh, tuning, but we want to have some continuous tuning, which is uh, more appealing and more interesting to the community. And so our next step was to elaborate more practical procedure. Uh, and this, this was also done not so long ago. So we started again with the same design of the disks. Again, looked at the modes of these disks, which are shown here. Uh, so the lowest frequency mode corresponds to magnetic dipole, aligned along this vertical axis. Then there are some electric dipoles, magnetic dipoles, and so on. And then we asked ourselves, what if we break uh, mirror symmetry in a different plane, let's say x, y plane, uh, as shown in the picture. Clearly, uh, we know that magnetic dipole aligned along x axis is odd under reflection in x, y plane, while electric dipole mode, which is uh, aligned along y axis, should be even uh, with respect to the reflection in x-y plane. If we break reflection symmetry, we mix these two modes. Uh, so this, and then we, we get this hybrid mode, which includes the contributions, both from magnetic dipole and from electric dipole. And again, we can try to play the same trick, uh, exploit the hybrid nature of the modes, uh, then uh, design orientation dependent coupling of the meta atoms, and then try to design some topology based on that. So what kind of advantage do we get here? Now, if we put two meta atoms in this way, we can uh, rotate them with respect to each other continuously by, ch by changing the angle between uh, these slits from zero to pi. So we have a continuous tuning. 
Of course, uh, now we need some, we need to do some optimization and check uh, how the coupling between the meta atoms changes when we rotate them with respect to each other. So this is the results of full wave numerical simulations uh, done by, by my PhD student, Daniel. And importantly, we see that the splitting of these hybrid modes in the meta atoms due to their interaction can change up to three times. So if these meta atoms are orientated in the same way, we get this small splitting. If we rotate them by 180 degrees, uh, then we, we can change this uh, coupling up to three times. And this was it, it was obvious immediately that this can be done experimentally. So this is robust and this should work. And uh, we indeed uh, made such a structure based on ceramic, ceramic particles operating in the microwave range, high permittivity ceramics. So all as as, as needed and arranged uh, our structure in this way. So basically this is like, uh, again, alternating coupling amplitudes. The disks orientated in the same way, in a different way, in the same way, in the different way. So we get Sushri vertical model with a domain wall uh, in the middle. And it, we excite this structure by the incident plane wave uh, with a suitably chosen polarization, which couples uh, to the modes of interest. So let's look at the experimental results and try to understand them. So what we measured, uh, or our colleagues measured, uh, so was the distribution of electric field on top of our array. So the vertical line corresponds to the coordinate along the array. Mm -hmm. And then they scan this field distribution at all frequencies uh, in, in, the, in the range of interest, let's say from nine to 10 gigahertz. So let's look. Uh, if we get some ripples here, this corresponds to some standing wave. We have, we have maximum of the field in some uh, points, uh, but there is no uh, pronounced localization. If all the disks are oriented in the same way as, as shown in the inset, we get these standing wave profiles at all frequencies. Mm -hmm. So no, nothing, nothing localized uh, appears here, as expected, of course. So all, all the particles are arranged in the same way. Now we do that another trick. So we rotate part of the particles by 150 degrees. So we, uh, like shown in, the, in this inset, so we modify the coupling between the particles again, uh, so th these experiments were done by Chinese, so they were careful enough to, you know, you know to double, double check the results. And uh, uh, the results are really nice because they, they coincide with the numerical simulations very, very closely. So what do we, do we uh, have here? Again, if we look at low frequencies, we again recover the same standing wave profiles at 9, 9.2, 9.4, but then uh, when we reach uh, some frequency around 9.8, we see that there is some slight localization in the middle of the array, which corresponds to the domain wall. It's like a stack of two SSH models. So we discussed previously the H state. Now this should be interface state. And we see that there is some localization, but it is like not so strong, not so persuasive. And then we rotate these uh, meta atoms by one, 180 degrees. Uh, as you see from the previous diagram, this should uh, strongly modify the couplings between the particles. So the dimerization should become stronger. And what do we get in experimental data? Let's look. Uh, here we get, get the same standing waves, no surprise here. But more importantly, at this frequency, a localized state emerges. So you, you see a clear maximum of the field in the middle of the array with some uh, much smaller amplitudes uh, at the edges of the structure. So this uh, suggests that there is some topological transition happening in the system, and we can continuously tune uh, the localization length of this uh, interface state. Uh, but to identify the frequency of this interface state more precisely, we plot so-called local density of states. But technically, what is that? We just measure uh, the intensity of the field uh, over the central element of the lattice. And plot. I'm sorry, I just have a very small question about the previous slide and this slide and this one. How do you excite this lattice to measure these lines in experiment? Uh, yeah, so I have to, to show this slide. Uh, so the excitation is performed by quasi-plane wave, so almost plane uh, wave. And but then it, it's not sent from the edge, it's, 
it is sent from the direction which is perpendicular to the lattice, yes? Yes, you're absolutely right. So from the uh, top. Mm -hmm. From the top. And so that is why there is no like apparent reason why the field should concentrate. And the only possible explanation of this localized state is that uh, the wave at this frequency hits the eigenmode. And this eigenmode exhibits uh, a localized uh, field pattern. And actually, this is consistent with, with numerics, of course. So uh, how should we identify the, the frequency of the interface mode? We plot uh, the intensity of the field over this central element uh, as a function of the driving frequency. If all the disks are orientated in the same way, we have no pronounced peaks. So because we do not have any interface states, this is expected. But for some moderate rotation angles, we recover well-pronounced peak around 9.8. Uh, in the simulations, in experiments, almost the same frequency. Uh, and uh, so we can analyze the field distribution at the frequency that corresponds to this specific peak. Uh, and so we, we visualize the field distribution. And indeed, we, we see more or less clear picture. Uh, in the measurement, it's, it's no worse than in the simulations. Which, is, which shows us the formation of the interface state with this staggered profile of the field as expected for SSH physics. And so what we can claim based on that theory plus experiments, we can claim uh, that uh, we observe the emergence of topological interface state uh, with tunable localization length. And this is in contrast to the previous studies because uh, it's, not, it's much harder to tune some localization length in other designs you, you have to fabricate different samples, basically. But here you can fabricate a single sample and tune everything by just rotating these disks by hand. Yeah. And so these results were uh, uploaded to archive. Uh, so just, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we submitted it to ACS Photonics and just hoping that, <laughs> you know, referees will remain unbiased and so on. Uh, yeah, so it's under consideration. But it's not the end of the story because one dimensional physics nowadays is not so exciting. Uh, people uh, wrote a lot of papers on Sushi for Higgler model. Nobody is surprised by that stuff. So the next question which we put uh, was the following. Can we extend this approach towards some two dimensional systems, which is much more exciting and interesting. And I'm proud to say we did this uh, as well. And the experiments were performed here in St. Petersburg, in ITMO. Uh, so again, we exploit the same way of symmetry breaking. But now we arrange these particles in a bit different manner. So now all of them are in plane. And then we have two tuning parameters, uh, this rotation angle theta 1 and this rotation angle theta 2. As a consequence, uh, the map of the uh, eigenmode splitting becomes a two-dimensional. So this is the splitting of the eigenmode frequency as a function of theta one and theta two. So very magnificent picture, but using it, we can, you know, we can tailor some topological properties. Now we, we think about constructing lattice of such trimers. So we put these split on resonators. We can uh, align the gaps towards the center of the unit cell or outside of the center of the unit cell. And our calculations show that the, uh, the couplings between these elements in this configuration and in this configuration can differ up to two times. So two is, uh, I would say, enough, enough for doing experiments. And these uh, structures can be readily fabricated by PCB technology. So you print just metallic elements on the dielectric substrate. It's relatively cheap and uh, can be done fastly. And so we proceeded with the fabrication of this kind of structure. This is actually the photo of experimental structure, which is, uh, you know, uh, with some painting on, on the top of this, of this photo. Uh, and uh, we can clearly see the inner domain here, which is formed by the split ring resonators orientated by their gaps outside and outer domain, which consists of the trimers with the gaps pointing inside. So due to the orientation dependent coupling of these split ring resonators, we, we are quite confident that this system is equivalent to the so-called breathing cabome lattice. In the breathing cabome lattice, uh, the whole game is played 
via alternating distances between the sides. But here, the whole trick is to arrange uh, the orientations of the split ring resonators. And this breathing carbonylitis is claimed uh, to host corner modes. So uh, zero dimensional modes localized at the corner, which is related to high order topology. Now we propose like a different approach, a different route to high order topology, not by lattice engineering, but instead by using hybrid resonances of the individual particles. So uh, of course we have to check topological properties. Uh, so uh, if you allow me, I will skip the technical details here. Uh, I will only say that to check the topological properties in 2D, you have to check the symmetry of the eigenstates relative to C3 rotations in several high symmetry points of the Brillouin zone. This can be done uh, also from numerical simulations uh, using the prescription, which is formulated by uh, some other theorists. Uh, and what we see, what is important here, is that when we rotate the split rings from this configuration to this, our band gap, which is present in, in our spectrum, changes from trivial to the topological. So this means that uh, this domain is uh, trivial, and this domain is topological, and hence, due to the bulk boundary correspondence, there should be some H and interface states uh, at the boundary of these two domains. This is like a conclusion from the theory, and we can, very, we can check this in experiments. Again, we do the same uh, type of measurements, but now they are more tedious because the structure is two dimensional. So we have to scan uh, the field uh, over all structures at all frequencies. Uh, it is time demanding. So this was done uh, by a student uh, in our group here at ITMO. Uh, he spent a lot of time, of course, on that, but still in microwave experiments, this is more or less controllable. So he puts uh, electric dipole antenna here at the top this excite, it excites the structure, and then he collects the signal uh, by the loop antenna, moving it uh, from the bottom, from, so from the other side of this uh, sample. And so, uh, post-processing the results, he extracts uh, the magnitude of S12 uh, coefficient, so the transmission coefficient, uh, in specific domains. For instance, we are interested in the modes which are localized at the corners of our triangular structure. Therefore, it is reasonable to take the sum of S12 parameters at the points corresponding to the corners. So this, this dependence of this quantity on frequency is shown in this picture. Clearly, if we get a, a peak in this dependence, this corresponds to some eigenmode which is resonant at this frequency and has a lot of field at the corners. So this is corner mode. Then we retrieve the profile of the field, which we measured, and indeed we observe nice corner localization. So this is experimental data. It's not, it's not numerics, by the way. Then in the same way, we can be interested in the H states. Uh, how should we proceed in that case? We have to sum uh, all the transmission coefficients for the sites at the edges of our triangular domain. The results are plotted by the orange color, or maybe red, depending on your monitor. Uh, so we get, again, some characteristic frequency. Again, we inspect the field distribution at this frequency, and we obtain the H state. Again, this is experimental data, uh, suitably renormalized uh, just for the presentation purpose. And we see a nice H state. And this is uh, in line with, uh, with our numerical simulations. So these theory and experiments were recently done and also uploaded at archive. Uh, but the paper goes slowly because it was again submitted to laser and photonics reviews. So <laughs> it's, it's not a very fast journal, I, I must say. Good. So as a summary of this part, uh, I, I would like to highlight that orientation-dependent couple. Uh, excuse me, Maxim. Could you, before you switch to uh, summary, uh, what is the size of the structure relative to the wavelengths? Uh, well, so the, the unit cell is smaller than the wavelength, so we can say that this is metamaterial. But of course, the whole structure is is larger than the wavelength. Uh, so uh, it, it's just hard to you know to to, to pick up the the, the numbers. 
uh, unit cell what uh, what is here unit cell the unit cell is these uh, three uh, three split ring resonators mm -hmm. but the whole structure is is, is of course much larger much larger it contains so, let's say so, uh, around 10 unit cells so it's uh, this triangle was something about order of the wavelengths right it's like one third or one fourth of the wavelength so it, uh, it a single uh, trimer is smaller than the wavelength but uh, the whole structure uh, what what is the wavelength for 10 gigahertz well so 10 gigahertz it's 10 to 10 uh, it's like three centimeters uh, yeah yeah okay so it's uh, three centimeters and then we have centimeter sized uh, periods of the lattice. So this is comparable. Mm -hmm. Good, so uh, to summarize this part, uh, first of all, we put forward this concept uh, of uh, designing uh, the topology of the bands via orientation of the meta atoms by tailoring their resonances instead of doing complicated lattices. And in some cases, this this strategy can be really advantageous because it allows to reconfigure the topological states very flexibly, which may be useful for some applications, I don't know. And importantly, our approach can be readily extended towards two-dimensional systems, enabling higher order topology and maybe some other exotic phenomena. And now we are actively thinking uh, about uh, further generalizations towards three-dimensional structures and metamaterials where we can get maybe even more exciting physics. But this requires some theoretical efforts, some further analysis, and is, I would say, really challenging. So this was the main part which I wanted to present to you, but I, I want in the remaining couple of minutes uh, to briefly mention some other research directions which are pursued by my group, by myself, uh, and our recent publications in really good journals. As I mentioned in the introductory part, it's very interesting uh, to answer the following question. Can we harness these nice concepts of topology to protect quantum entanglement, uh, some quantum correlations? This is very promising uh, problem, important problem for quantum technologies, which are rapidly developing these days. And I'm proud to say that in the very beginning of this whole topic of quantum topological states, we published a theoretical paper with uh, Alex Padumny, where we predicted the mechanism, how this topological state of photon pairs can form. Uh, and this theoretical paper, just in a few years, received uh, a serious development. So together with my uh, PhD student, Nikita uh, Alekhna, so we proposed a, an approach for analog simulation of two photon topological states and we're able to publish uh, our results in Nature Communications. So all co-authors from Russia, uh, from Itno University, uh, almost all. Uh, then we made a next step forward and uh, we started a collaboration with the group in MISIS uh, led by Professor Rustinov and uh, implemented our ideas experimentally with the help of arrays of superconducting qubits. So this was very time demanding experiment, I would say very tough. Uh, one of the first papers uh, about topological states and qubit rays. But the referees like were critical. So they were asking which kind of robustness we have or only robustness to the couplings between the qubits. It's not so interesting, but what is what about robustness in the, uh, to the eigenfrequencies in the qubits? And as a result, we were able to publish this only in physical review B, but still I think this is really nice experimental work. Also, uh, I had a couple of nice collaborations with the uh, leading you know, experts in topological photonics uh, in the world. Uh, so the group of Professor Mohammed Hafizi in the University of Maryland and the group of Professor Hani Kaif, both works devoted to high order topological states. Uh, so both published in Nature Photonics, which is considered as number one journal in, in the area of optics and photonics. Uh, so this was a couple of years ago. Uh, we also developed some strategies to probe uh, topological fields, uh, states from the far field. Uh, so doing some spectroscopy of topological states. Uh, so it's like a separate topic for presentation. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time. And uh, the only thing I would like to say a couple of words 
uh, about new direction which we are now developing uh, in collaboration with Professor Frank Wilczyk, who is Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he received a Nobel Prize in, uh, in the domain of high energy physics. And back in 1987, he predicted such a hypothetical particle called axion. So nowadays, people are still looking for these hypothetical axions. Uh, there is no doubt that if someone discovers this hypothetical particle, then they will receive Nobel Prize. That's, that's for sure. But this is very challenging. And then we spoke with uh, Frank, so we discussed some potential collaborations. And then we got a very nice idea that the equations of axion electrodynamics uh, can be actually mapped onto the Maxwell's equations in a specially designed medium. And this medium is bionisotropic. Uh, but it's not kind of bionisotropy, which we discussed several slides above. It's a distinct type of bionisotropy, uh, but this still can be designed in experiments. So we are hoping that we will be able to do, you know, at least something in that uh, direction. It looks promising. Uh, so this project was supported by ITMO University within priority 2030 project. So like, we were very lucky to, to receive the, that support in December, 2029. Uh, of course, now it's, it's a bit more uncertain, but still we are open to collaborations. We will be happy to, to push this uh, activity further on. Uh, so we have some, so small advertisement. So we have some open PhD positions in, uh, in our department and in my group in particular, and also some vacancies for postdoc positions as well. Uh, so we're open to some other formats of collaborations as well. Uh, and uh, I believe this is a promising new direction which may result in further high impact publications. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And in case if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask, or if you have any maybe, uh, Further ideas, uh, please feel free to email me. I will be happy to discuss with you further. Thank you for attention. Okay, Maxim, thank you very much. Uh, questions, please, dear colleagues. Uh, while questions are coming, I have one question. You mentioned that uh, you studied disorder in the coupling between uh, your particles. Yeah. Yes. It is. Uh, is it the position of the particles, or what? What defines the coupling? What is the source of disorder? So here, uh, I, I, I guess we are discussing this this slide, and here we, we are just changing the distance between the particles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because why I'm asking is, uh, according to what I know, the, if you create some grating or something, the position of the particles in the grating is the most well-defined uh, parameter. The sizes of the particles, their composition or whatever, it is less defined. Yes, and yes, you are absolutely right. Yes, thank you for that comment. Actually, this is very ubiquitous story. Indeed, uh, in, in the case of arrays of qubits uh, and in the case of gratings, it's, it's much easier to control the distance rather than uh, the shape of the particle. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, these type of, of systems mm -hmm. are not protected against the disorder in the in, uh, shape of the particle, its material. Uh, mm -hmm because topology does not solve all problems. It solves just one specific problem. And unfortunately, it's not, uh, in, in most of the cases, it's, or in many cases, this is not uh, the most crucial. And yeah. we, we have to keep in mind that. Yeah, because to be honest, I am, uh, it is why I'm not, well, well, I'm a bit skeptical about this topology, because when you say topology, in fact, you keep something invariant. In your case, you keep invariant your two types of your particle. Yeah, you, you claim they are the same yes and, and then you show that indeed if you if they are the same then some disorder in the parameter okay as i told the distance is the best parameter but okay if you put disorder in the best parameter indeed it is the result is robust but uh, would you change your particle that in fact happens in the first row in my opinion i think yeah. it will not be that robust yeah is it Direct compression or not? Yes, yes, you are, you are right. So then the robustness will be lost. Of course, uh, as long as we have the band gap, uh, the edge state will survive. So mm -hmm. nothing dramatic will happen, but we will, do, we will not have such nice pictures. And this is one of the main reasons why we, uh, this nice experimental work with Kubitz, so which costed a lot of efforts to Alexei Ustinov group and to us, this was published in PRB because at some point referees told us, guys, 
if you invent uh, the way to handle disorder in the qubit frequencies, then come back, we will consider you in nature maybe, but now <laughs> uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the thing which we uh, would like to see. Yes, uh, as any new idea, th there is a grain of salt here. And uh, you are absolutely right by, by spoken. Well, it's, it's quite interesting because anyway, it's, uh, for me, it was a very instructive and very spectacular uh, viewpoint. And I appreciate it very much. I see question from Dmitry Solnishkov. Dmitry, you're welcome. Please, Dmitry. Uh, yes, just as another small question about the 2D structure that you have shown at the end of the main part of the talk. So it's uh -huh. the main part, 2D stuff with this Kagome breathing. Um, yeah. What about the, so you, there are edge states and corner states. Uh, just about the edge states, are they chiral or not? Uh, well, yes, I guess. Uh, uh, how should I say? Uh, I guess. It's the dispersion resembles uh, sushi Trohigra model, uh, but we do not have this. Of course, we have time reversal symmetry. Ah, so okay, if, probably if there is time reversals, may, maybe yeah. so maybe there are two uh, states propagating in opposite directions. Uh, yes, but, uh, yes, that, that, that's for sure. I was uh, thinking about okay, polarization. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So like, okay, thank you very much. <coughs> <clears throat> Good. Yeah, so maybe there are some questions on the last slides because this is like a new frontier laboratory which is launched in the <coughs> university. But frankly speaking, we didn't uh, we didn't have a lot of results so far. So we're just starting this collaboration, and you know the circumstances are quite complicated to develop these uh, new ideas. But we are still hoping that we will be able to do you know something. <laughs> we all hope for that. Yeah. Okay, uh, other questions, dear colleagues, that you have a good chance to ask an expert, so please use this time. If there are no more questions, then I think we should thank Maxim for a very interesting, a very good presentation. Thanks, Nikolai, for inviting me. And it is my great pleasure that we see here guests from Europe, and let's try to keep contact between Europe and Russia, at least in such a man. Okay, what can we do else? I don't know. Good. So, if there are no more questions, then uh, I don't know. We'll have uh, our next seminar. I don't know yet who will be the next Wednesday, but please follow our site and follow our announcement. Yeah, so I will appreciate if you share the recording with me uh, afterwards. Certainly, uh, certainly. We'll send you recording and uh, a link to recording and you perfect. can uh, download it. So, Thank you uh, so much and hope to see you offline at some point. We are not that far away from each other. <laughs> exactly, 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 Maxi. Thank Great. you for a very interesting uh, talk. Okay, Pavel Kohanchik is floating. Okay, it's not a question. Yeah. Great. Thank you and then goodbye. Yes, bye-bye everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.